Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. A very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. I welcome you all to today's session of the Hindu news analysis. As you know, every single day, each day of the week, sharp at 10 a.m., we bring this live newspaper analysis for all of you, where we discuss the most important articles from the Hindu newspaper. As you would have seen by now, we have also tried now to include prelims specific information from the newspaper. So apart from discussing certain articles in detail, we'll also be discussing certain information which is specifically important for your prelims examination, factual information that can be asked in various forms. So I hope all of you have been appreciating this edition in the Hindu news analysis session. Now, without waiting any further, let's see what are the important articles that we have here for you today. Now, as you know, usually on a Sunday, you do not see a lot of editorial or op-ed articles in the Hindu newspaper. And that is why on Sundays, you have to go through the other news stories. The one good thing about Sundays is that on Sundays, the Hindu newspaper usually carries a lot of news stories from science and tech as well. That is why today also, we will see a lot of news stories from science and tech specifically and some of the other news stories from other pages apart from the editorial page. The first important article that we will be discussing today is about what happened in Seattle in the US very very recently. On 21st of February, the Seattle City Council became the first US city to ban caste based discrimination. Now what exactly is this issue all about? Why are we discussing this? Let's try and understand. As you know, a lot of Indians have now settled in US for their jobs, for education, for various purposes. Seattle also has a huge population of Indians who have been living there. Now, when such huge population of Indians have been living anywhere across the entire world, they also take with themselves their own culture, their own history, the way that they behave. So what we are seeing is in the past few years that a lot of people who are of Indian origin have been facing caste based discrimination in different cities in the US as well. In Seattle, they have recognized this and now in Seattle, they have passed this law under which they have said that caste based discrimination will be illegal. Now, as we said, the need for the policy is very simple. Because a lot of Indians have settled in various parts of US right now, they have also become a kind of a voting base for the politicians. That is why you will see a lot of American politicians talking about Indian issues. A lot of American politicians, in fact, celebrate Indian festivals as well like Holi, Diwali, etc. Because they know that now that they have such a huge population of Indian origin people living in their area, they would also be a very significant voter base. That is why here also the Seattle State, the Seattle City Council, in fact, has passed this law saying that caste based discrimination will be illegal because they have been seeing certain incidents of this particular issue or this particular instance happening in US. You have been seeing how US and many other countries such as Australia, etc. have also been seeing a lot of hate crimes. Hate crimes means when people are discriminated against, when people are, let's say, attacked, the people are discriminated against on the basis of their caste, on the basis of their race. All these hate crimes, because these have become so prevalent in US, Australia, etc. That is why at the end of the day, we require certain policies. There is in fact data that suggests that discrimination in US has been increasing. For example, one in four Dalits in the US have faced verbal or physical assault. They have also been facing discrimination at work. Now you might say that isn't the caste based issue or caste based description an issue in India. How is it that the Dalits or depressed classes, how is it that they are facing discrimination in US? Again, the answer to this is the same because so many Indians have migrated from India to US. When you go to any other country, you also take with yourself your culture, your thinking, what you stand for. So if all your life in India, you believe that no, there are certain classes of people who should not be behaved properly with. 
if there are certain people in India who think that the Dalits should not take good jobs, then the same mentality goes to the US when they migrate to US. And that is where we are seeing a lot of discrimination against the Dalits in US as well. And this is why multiple US cities, multiple US states have been thinking of introducing such kind of laws to stop this kind of oppression of certain classes of people. Now, we all know and accept the fact that discrimination against the Dalits has been a sad reality in India for a long, long time. Although we do have a lot of laws that try to prevent such discrimination and we'll discuss what some of those laws today as well. However, the fact remains, despite all these laws, we still have a lot of discrimination against Dalits in India. And I can give you official data from NCRB. NCRB here, as you know, stands for National Crime Records Bureau. The NCRB, that is the National Crime Records Bureau, also tells us about how many crimes have been committed against the Dalits specifically. Census 2021, sorry, Census 2011 says that there are about 20 crore Dalits in India. To ensure that they do not face discrimination, there have been multiple laws and multiple rules that have been initiated from the side of the government. For example, we have the Constitution Scheduled Caste Order of 1950, which recognize Hindu Dalits as scheduled caste. Why? So that they can become a part of the mainstream, they can get reservation benefits, not just reservation in Lok Sabha, but also later on reservation in government jobs and education institutions as well. Later on, even those Dalits who converted to Sikhism or Buddhism were included in scheduled caste. Right now, the Supreme Court is still hearing a matter wherein the petitioners want even the Dalits who converted to Muslims or Christianity should also be considered as scheduled caste. Now, there are two ways to look at this entire issue. One way to look at is that yes, India has had this problem for many, many centuries. It's a problem that goes back to many centuries, more, much more before our independence era. That is the problem of caste-based discrimination. The other way to look at it is, what is happening is, because scheduled caste or scheduled tribes, since they get reservation benefits from the side of the government, that also creates a big gap. So people who do not get reservation benefits have this feeling that people belonging to depressed classes, people who are Dalits are taking away our jobs, are taking away our college or university seats. That also creates even a bigger divide between the two sides. One side which thinks that it is their right to take up all the jobs, the other side who believes that no, they also have the right to now come up in the mainstream. And that is why we are seeing an increasing number of crimes being committed against the Dalits. For example, the National Crime Record Bureau says in 2021, 50,900 cases of crimes were registered against scheduled caste, which is again an increase as compared to 2020. The states which lead in these numbers are usually Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh, where we see huge number of crimes being committed. Just recently, and this is such a sad reality, every few months, these kind of news stories come in that someone belonging to Dalit community is beaten up. Why? Because he or she drank water from the tank that was supposed to be only for the upper caste. We see news stories, people being beaten up. Why? Because they are Dalits and other people did not like. Why were they carrying their procession? How is it that you can ride a horse in your own wedding? All these things are still a reality. You saw the case of Rajasthan where a Dalit student was beaten up so badly, beaten up to death just because he drank water from a water tank that was apparently supposed to be for people who are from the upper caste. All these issues that we have are still a reality. The problem and the issue in these kind of cases is not that we don't have laws. We have multiple laws to deal with such kind of issues. But understand it is much more about implementation of the law. Let me give you one simple example. Let's assume in this case of Rajasthan only, 
where a student, a school student was beaten up so badly. Now let's assume his parents go to the police station to register a complaint. They go to police station, ask that we want to register an FIR because our son was beaten up so badly because he was a Dalit. In most cases what happens, since the policemen themselves belong to the upper caste, they will make sure that the FIR is just not registered. On paper, it seems very easy, yes, go to police station, register an FIR. But if any one of you has gone to police station, you would know it is so, so, so difficult to get your FIR registered that it actually takes a lot of efforts unless you actually have a lot of connections. Unless that case has got such a big limelight, it is very difficult to go ahead and register such FIRs. So in a lot of these cases, even the FIRs are not registered. That is why many people say this number of National Crime Record Bureau, the real number would be much, much larger than that because again the FIRs are not being registered. The number of cases, the number of crimes against the Dalits are very high in certain states such as Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, even Bihar and UP etc. as well. This is an, again an official data of the NCRB. This is slightly older. This is the NCRB data of 2019. But the pattern has kind of remained the same. In 2019 also, see the number of cases, number of crimes being committed against the Dalits in different states. Rajasthan at the top, Madhya Pradesh, then Bihar, Gujarat, Telangana, Uttar Pradesh, Kerala, etc. Now, if you see here, the states with a higher population, the states mainly in the Hindi belt, they are also one of those, they are also the states that are usually at the top. Look at Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, then UP. These are usually the states that remain at the top. Now, there is a stringent law in India to prevent atrocities against scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. That law is called Scheduled Caste and Tribes Prevention of Atrocities Act of 1989. It is a very stringent law. If you discriminate against scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, if you commit an offense against them, there should be very strict punishment given to them. The aim is to prevent any offense other than scheduled castes and scheduled tribes against scheduled castes and scheduled tribes themselves. Anyone who is not a member of scheduled caste or scheduled tribe and commits an offense against a scheduled caste or scheduled tribe would be considered an offender under this. All these are cognizable offenses. What is cognizable offense? What is cognizable offense? See, the problem is most of our understanding about how the police works is from the movies only. Because the good part is most of you would not have seen the police functioning very closely. Most of you would not have interacted with the police also. So mostly our understanding about how the police works is mostly from the movies. So we think because it is seen in the movies, we think that when the police goes to arrest someone, the person will ask, where is the warrant? Only when you tell her, give us the warrant, you can actually come inside. But that is not always true. There are certain cases in which warrant is required. Then there are certain cases in which a warrant is not required. So those cases which are cognizable. In other words, those are very serious offenses. Cognizable offenses, very serious offenses let's say murder etc in those cases when the police goes the police can arrest without the warrant as well those are cognizable offenses cognizable offenses are those which are considered very very serious so any offense against scheduled cars scheduled tribes is considered as a cognizable offense so government from its side has made the law very strict but again it really depends on the implementation of the law which is lacking in this case before I go on to the second important news story, let me take, see if there are a few questions here. Okay. Yes, there are a lot of, as you know, most of you would have read fundamental rights. In fundamental rights, you see that there are multiple articles that talk about not discriminating against people on the basis of caste, religion, etc. But again, the problem is not the lack of laws. The problem mainly is in the implementation problem issue. Then I have a question. Can you please clarify whether Indian people in US are doing discrimination against Indian Dalits or US is doing? See, understand this. If there is someone who is a US citizen, 
how will they know who is a Dalit, who is not a Dalit? Understand this, right? It would only be Indians who would know who is a Dalit, who is not a Dalit. In US, there is still discrimination, but their discrimination is different. In US, people are discriminated on the basis of race. It is when Indians go there, they identify, oh, you belong to this caste, so I will not give you jobs, I'll behave like this. So, the definition of who is a Dalit, the identification, the US will not know that. Then, okay, uh, there's a question, can we use the word Dalit in means? Absolutely, you can use the word Dalit in means, no issues with that. Perfect, let's move ahead then. The next important news story is about the UPI, the Unified Payments Interface. One of those technologies which has actually brought India's name to the world stage. Now please understand this. Yes, India has a lot of IT companies. We do a lot of uh, computer engineering stuff. But reality is, if you look at the past 50 years, there are not many technologies from India or the technologies which have started in India that have been famous all around the world. Yes, we do a lot of uh, consulting. Yes, we do a lot of software manufacturing. But again, at the end of the day, most of the new age technologies, most of the cutting edge companies that we talk about are somewhere set based outside India. When an Indian technology, a technology that is made in India, starts making the news around the world, it is a really proud moment. It is a moment to understand how India's power, India's soft power is expanding beyond our borders. One great example of this is UPI. As you would have seen in the news, UPI is now being linked with Singapore's pay now. So Singapore also has a similar kind of system pay now where you can make real time payments. In India, we use UPI. Now what the government is doing is government is trying to expand UPI beyond India. Government is trying to make sure that when you go to other countries, let's say you go to Singapore or you go to UAE, you should be able to use a UPI in the same manner. With Singapore, it has already been done. India is trying to do a same kind of a deal with UAE as well. Why? We are choosing those countries where there are considerable amount of Indians. Either they have gone to study or they have gone to work. If there is a huge presence of Indian diaspora in some other countries, it would make sense to integrate the payment systems of the two countries so that person to person payment facilities can be done much more easily. I am sure every one of you would have used the UPI now. The great part is how fast, how quickly UPI has spread all across the country. There was a time and I still remember there was a time that you just did not want to leave the house without your wallet. You did not or you thought that if you are leaving the house without the wallet, you cannot get anything. And now mostly when I go outside, I don't really take my wallet as long as I have my phone with me because I know from the vegetable vendor who is sitting on the road to the biggest of malls, I know at all these places I will be able to use a UPI. So one, yes, UPI is a great technology, but the other great part that has happened is how fast it has spread, how fast it has been accepted all around the country. And the reason why this has been done, the biggest reason why UPI has spread so fast in the country is that it is free of cost. So if you are paying a merchant from using UPI, then the merchant does not have to give any commission somewhere. At least so far, we are not seeing any commission being paid. On the other hand, with credit card, etc., you merchant had to give certain commission. 1%, 1.5%, that was a commission the merchants have to give to the banks. So merchants also now want UPI to go ahead rather than credit cards. That is why UPI has become extremely famous. Now, how will it help? Let's just imagine, let's say you are going to Singapore just for a vacation for a week or 10 days etc now when usually you go to singapore how do you pay money either you exchange singapore's currency here you take singapore's currency in india or you use your card then you have to give certain commission on that all these issues all these options are actually cumbersome either you exchange your currency or you use your cards all of that will have a lot of commission in between if now I am sure 
that my UPI payment system will work in Singapore also. It will be so much easier for the tourists, for people who are visiting Singapore and that will bring the economies even closer. Right now it has been decided that the limit will be 60,000 rupees per day of transaction. 60,000 rupees per day is about 1,000 Singapore dollars. Close to 1,000 Singapore dollars, 60,000 rupees. That is what the limit is right now. As you know, UPI has been developed by National Payments Corporation of India called the NPCI. This is the body that is responsible for making the UPI. Now, when you use a UPI, you also know there are banks at the back end. So when I pay money to someone through UPI, money is going from my bank account to someone else's bank account directly. It is not getting stored in the wallet. It is going directly from bank account to the bank account. Meaning that to use UPI, you have to have certain banks in the backdrop. So which are the banks which will help India and Singapore come together? From the side of India, SBI, Indian Overseas Bank, Indian Bank and ICICI Bank. These banks will help in inward and outward remittances. Inward remittances means they will accept payment from Singapore also. Outward remittance means they will allow from their account money to go to Singapore people, Singapore merchants also. On the other hand, Access Bank, DBS India Bank, they will facilitate in inward remittance only. Means if you have an Access account or you have a DBS account, then you can transfer money to them but not from them for now. With the time the number of banks will also increase. The other banks will also be added. But for now this is what the idea is. These are the banks that have already been listed. Now as you know all this is real time money transfer. That is by far the best part about UPI. You are not bound by 10 to 6, you are not bound by bank timings, whenever you want to transfer you can and it is instant. The moment that you transfer the money, that very moment the money will go to the other person's or recipient's bank account. So it's an immediate instant transfer that builds a lot of trust. See, all the financial transactions are based on one single word that is trust. If I have transferred the money to you, but I tell you the money will come to your bank account after five days. Then there is a lack of trust in between. On the other hand, if I transfer the money and the recipient bank account says that money has already been received, that is what builds the trust. And that is why UPI has been so, so, so successful in India. Number one, as I told you, it has been successful. Why? Because it is without any fee, at least for now, there is no fee attached to it. Secondly, it is instant. You can do it right away. Thirdly, you don't require a lot, any paperwork to sign up for it. Just download the app as long as your phone number is registered with your bank account. That is the only thing that you require. As long as it's registered from the bank account, that is good enough. You would be able to use the UPI. <clears throat> as I told you, India is trying to have a same kind of agreement with other countries as well, where there are a lot of Indians. We have been in talks with UAE also to do the same. The system works 24-7, 365 days. Whenever you want, this is immediate, instant money transfer. Now, <clears throat> as I told you earlier, India has been trying to sign a same kind of agreement with many other nations as well. Although Singapore has already been, fi has already been final, there are some other examples as well. Let me give you. In Bhutan, UPI QR based payments have been enabled. So Bhutan is also one example. Then in UAE also cross border UPI payments have been enabled. So there are some countries where cross border payments have been enabled. What is different in Singapore is that just like we have UPI, Singapore has their own system called pay now. So using pay now app, they will be able to pay in our bank account and using our app such as Paytm phone pay, we will be able to pay to their account as well. So it works both ways in case of Singapore. In other countries such as Bhutan, Nepal, etc. QR code payments are now working. So from your phone, you can have a QR code and the money will be transferred. Inward money transfer has not started in those countries. So. Bhutan, Nepal, the two-way transfer has not been done. 
but with Singapore that has already been done it is integrated with their pay now system and that is a great part as you know UPI has been established by NPCI National Payment Corporation of India it developed in 2016 and within a few years it has been spread all across the country now what is this NPCI it is a government entity it is in fact an umbrella organization established by the RBI and the Indian Banks Association it is registered as a not-for-profit company so it is not earning any profit it is not taking any commission at least for now as I've been saying maybe later on they would like to take certain payments so that they can maintain this system in the long run but at least for now we do not see any kind of commission being charged over here there is one other very interesting data I wanted to share with you just look at this graph that shows you the humongous growth that UPI has shown since 2016 when it first initiated till September 2022 till when till the time that the graph is the value of transactions on UPI has reached 11 lakh 16 thousand crore already and it has gone even higher and higher this is one way to look at it the other way to look at it is see India's biggest strength has always been our population because so many people in India can use this technology and the usage of technology has also become easier with the access to data. India right now has the cheapest data available almost all around the world. With Jio coming in, forcing all the other companies to reduce the data rates, that has also pushed our country towards a digital economy much faster. However, there is one other thing that you have to understand here most of the transactions in UPI are still very very low value transactions look at this number if you see transactions which are happening in UPI from 0 to 500 is where most of the transactions still are very high value transactions are still much much lower so UPI is still being used for people who are giving small amount of money to let's say shopkeepers to vegetable vendors to the local vendors etc this is how most of the money is still being transferred in UPI because one part of the reason is in a lot of ways people in India don't trust technology with their money so a lot of people in India still think that having cash on delivery is much better than paying online because they think what will what happens if my money gets stuck similarly with UPI also since it's a digital transfer of money many people believe that I will only do small transactions when it comes to bigger transactions let's say thousands of rupees then most people don't prefer using the UPI because again they believe that more money going into this system might be dangerous so that is a problem of mindset that we still have to develop further the next important article that we will discuss is on an issue which nations around the world especially the developed nations are discussing that is the debt burden now as you know recently the Indian government hosted a G20 finance minister meeting in Bangalore I don't know how many of you know this or not so when there is a G20 year, G20 summit, before the G20 summit actually takes place, we have a lot of meetings of different dignitaries from all around the world. So in Bangalore, we just had the finance minister meeting of the G20 world. Now, in this finance minister meeting of the G20 world, the main theme of discussion was that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and then because of the Ukraine Russia crisis the smaller countries are under a huge amount of debt and we should now look into it either we should forgive the debt or we should try to reduce the rate of interest somehow now developed world has been doing this for a long time World Bank anyways gives loans at, at a smaller rate of interest many other developed nations like Japan etc when they give a loan they give a loan at a smaller rate of interest but the problem here is with one single country that is China now it might come as a surprise to many people China right now is the largest lender in the world 
even more than the World Bank or the IMF. The amount of money that China has given in loan to other nations is more than what the World Bank has given and it is more than what IMF has given. That means China has so much power, so much influence because its money is flowing around in the entire world. So unless China says that okay we will forgive the debt, until China says this it will not be a success. Because it is the Chinese money that is flowing around the world. And this is where the problem starts. <clears throat> China is not interested in giving away their debt. In fact, if you look at China, when they give a debt to any country, their debt is usually higher than the rate of interest at the market rate. They charge a high rate of interest so that they can earn more money. And the sad part is China uses its debt trap. China uses this debt trap to force the other countries to take the debt. I'll give you some examples. It is very famous that China usually tries to give loan to those projects which from where money will never come back. I'll give you two very interesting examples so that you can understand yourself. I'll give an example of Hamman Tota. All of you would have heard of the name Hamman Tota Port, right? All of you would have heard the name. So basically, what exactly is this issue? Now, Sri Lanka is a very small country. And for a country of the size of Sri Lanka, having one port is good enough. So Sri Lanka has a port in Colombo. Sri Lanka already has a port in Colombo. But the problem is, just like in India, when there are elections, politicians make big promises. Similarly, in Sri Lanka also, when there are elections, politicians make big promises. Now in Sri Lanka, you all would have heard about the Rajapaksha family. You all would have heard about the Rajapaksha family, right? The Rajapakshas, one brother becomes a prime minister, other, become, other brother becomes the president, then someone in the family becomes the defense minister, so on and so forth. So Rajapaksha family, very powerful family in Sri Lanka. A few years back, Rajapaksha family, since they belong to Hamban Tota, it's a small town, they belong to Hamban Tota. They promised that if we win the elections, we will build a port in Hamban Tota. Why? Because when they build a port in Hamban Tota, there will be a lot of jobs. They said many people will be getting jobs in construction. We'll earn money. So when they won the election, the Raja Pakshas wanted to implement this idea to build this huge port. Now they did not have the money. So they went to the World Bank. They asked for a loan. World Bank said, no, no, no. Are you stupid? Because if we give you the loan, you will never be able to pay it back. Why? See, how does a port earn the money? A port earns money when a ship would come, stop at the port, and then they would give rent to the port. So whenever any ship comes to dock, to stay there, they will have to pay a fee. So a port will not earn money if no ship comes there. As simple as that. So World Bank said you already have the Colombo port. Why would a ship come to Hamban Tota port? It will stay at Colombo. But Sri Lanka wanted to build the port. So they came to India. They asked for a loan. India also said no. We can't give you the loan because this is not a great idea. Whenever there is a stupid idea. There is always one country who is ready to finance that. And that is China. China said oh don't worry I am your brother. I will give you the loan. Come to me don't worry. I am here. China said I will give you the money. Now the problem here is when Chinese give the money, let's say for construction of Hamman Tota port, it will never bring jobs to the country. It will never bring jobs to the country because understand something. How does China work? The Chinese government says we will give you the loan. Okay. You have to build a port. Okay. We will give you, let's assume, loan of $10 billion. But China will say the condition is, our company will build the port, not Sri Lankan company. Because we don't trust Sri Lankan company. So this money will go to a Chinese company only. Chinese construction company. So a Chinese construction company will get the money. They will send their workers to Sri Lanka to build the port. So now what happens? Did Sri Lanka get even one job? No, Sri Lanka will not get jobs. Because it is the Chinese workers only who are coming to Sri Lanka to build the port. So that money is going from Chinese government to a Chinese company only. And that company is owned by Chinese government only. Do you see the circle? 
Chinese government giving money to Chinese company. That Chinese company owned by Chinese government. So Sri Lanka's plan, we will get jobs and more people will come here. Nothing happened. All the jobs were with China. The port got constructed and as expected, no ship came to the port. There was no income from the port. So Sri Lanka said, oh, now we don't have money. China said, you have to give back the money no matter what. Sri Lanka said, we don't have the money. So China said, okay, so we will take over the Hamban Tota port for 99 years. Now this is our property. Whatever we do here doesn't matter. This is what China does. Exactly the same has happened with Pakistan also. China sold them this big dream of CPEC. That we will build China-Pakistan economic corridor. Don't worry, we will invest 500 billion dollars in China. Or Pakistan was like, oh, money raining from everywhere. 500 billion dollars will rain from the, from the sky. But nothing of that sort happened. Because again, the jobs were Chinese. Chinese came there to build the entire corridor. The corridor is now half built, half not built. Pakistan can't give back the loan. And again, all that is still not going anywhere. These are the two examples that all of you are familiar with. Now, let me give you one more example that many of you might not be familiar with. One other example is Ecuador. A country that we usually don't hear about. So basically what China does is they have so much excessive money that they keep on sending money everywhere. So what they did with Ecuador, let's try and understand. <clears throat> Chinese government went to Ecuador. They talked to the ruling party. They told the ruling party, you want to earn money, right? Or you want to earn some votes. You want to win the election. So let me give you a trick. Chinese government said, you promise to your people that we will build a new city altogether. We will build a new city. We will build factories and tech parks, etc. A lot of companies will come. And when these companies will come, they will get a lot of jobs. So Ecuador said, but we don't have the money to do that. China said, don't worry, I'm here. I will give you the money. You just promise to your people so that people will give you the votes. You will win the election. We will give you the loan. You build the city. No problem with that. I am here. I am your brother. So Ecuador said, okay. So China goes, gives us money to Ecuador. They start building the city. And when they start building the city, all of a sudden, the construction quality is so bad that before the city is built, there are cracks developing everywhere. The buildings are falling down. So Ecuador said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want this project to go on. They stopped the project in between. But China said, we don't care, you give us the money back because you took our money. So now Ecuador is all in the dead trap. They took the money for a city which is not even built, but Chinese money has already been spent. So they are asking now give us the money back. And there are so many of these stories all around the world. Look at Djibouti, look at Ecuador, look at Angola, look at Ghana, look at all these nations where China has just given the money. And they choose those projects specifically because Chinese know the money will not go, come back. And because the money will not come back, this is how they will actually acquire as much property as possible. If you look at here, how the Chinese government has been giving its debt. They have been increasingly giving debt, especially in Africa. Why? Because China knows Africa is the hub of mineral resources. China wants these countries not to pay back the loan because the moment they default on the loan, China will say, okay, now your land is yours. Now we will extract minerals from here. Now you can't say anything to us. That is why if you see increasingly the amount of loan that they're given to Africa, this is in green, has increased over the years and years. And that is how they are using their money. Now, look at some examples of how much debt certain countries owe to China. Look at this. Djibouti owns 43% of their GDP is actually debt to China. Are you understanding 43% of the GDP? Let me give you a very simple example. If you just compare this with India, I'll give you a simple example. So Djibouti's 43% of GDP is their debt to China. India's GDP is right now close to $3.5 trillion. That is India's GDP. Now imagine if I said 
India owns 43% of our GDP to debt in China. Do you know how much would that be? Close to 1.5 trillion dollars. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if we had to give 1.5 trillion dollars to China? That is what China does. They have so much debt going around the world that they can go anywhere and they know that they have pressure over all these different nations and when it comes to these nations choosing between China and other countries they will have to go with China. You might have read about the string of pearls policy. So India for example believes that China is following a string of pearls policy. String of pearls means India believes that China is giving loans to countries around India so that they can actually gather or they can actually surround India. For example, they have given loan to Djibouti, they have given loan to Maldives, they have given loan to Sri Lanka, they have given loan to, uh, they have given loan here to Bangladesh, they have given loan here to Pakistan, etc, etc. So we believe that China is surrounding us, there is a string of pearls that they are building. China obviously derives that, China says no, nothing like that has happened. These were the articles for the analysis for the mains point of view. Now, as we have seen, we have now started discussing certain factual articles in short for prelims point of view specifically. So let's see what exactly are the prelims news that we have in the newspaper today, mainly factual. The one first news is scientist Dr. Hari Balakrishnan has been conferred with the Marconi Prize. What is the Marconi Prize? Marconi Prize is a top honor given to computer scientists mainly from all around the world. So he is a professor at the MIT Massachusetts Institute of Technology and he has been given this award for significant contribution in increasing digital inclusivity. This is the Marconi Prize. These kind of very short factual questions can be asked in the prelims. Usually, please remember when you read these facts in the prelims please understand individuals or their names are not that important usually individual names are not us unless it is a historical name so more importantly is to remember the name of the prize and what exactly is the prize given for so marconi prize for example here is given for computer science mainly these are the parameters that are taken into consideration but while giving this prize, importance of the work in setting the stage for influencing the entire world, then contribution to innovation, entrepreneurship, giving new ideas, etc. What has been the social humanitarian impact? These are the things taken into consideration while giving this prize that has been given to Dr. Hari Balakrishna. Similarly, there is another news story that is Jordan will host talks between Palestine and Israel. I am sure all of you would have read in detail about Palestine and Israel issue. How the issue started, what is the problem between Palestine and Israel. Unfortunately, every few weeks we see the story that there are clashes between Palestine and Israel. Many people lose their lives. Again, this has come in the news because of that reason only. Because of recent spat between the two sides, which has led to 11 Palestinians being killed and more than 80 injured. The reason was that Israeli troops raided the city of Nablus in West Bank area. Jordan has now come into picture. Jordan has said that don't worry, we will try and negotiate between the two. So in these kind of news stories, what do you have to study? What do you have to study is map. See, every single year in the prelims examination, you will see one or even two questions based on maps where you will be asked about what are the border areas, which country shares a border with which country. So make sure that you do read maps about those areas which are in the news. For example, this is the map of Israel. As you know, right now, Palestinians have only two areas where they live. One is called Gaza Strip. This is the Gaza Strip. And this is the other area called the West Bank. Even in entire West Bank, it's not that only Palestinians live. In most of West Bank area also, there's a lot of Israeli Jewish settlement. From this graph or from this map rather, 
what i want you to remember is the nations that share a border with these countries so look here this is jordan sharing a border here this is egypt this is syria over here at the northern side there is lebanon also now i have a small bit of homework for all of you this water body that you see this is the mediterranean i'm sure all of you would know this is the mediterranean what i want you to tell me in the comment section of the video after the video ends you have to tell me which is this water body this is what your homework is which water body is this tell me in the comment section of the video once the video ends that is in the southern part of israel when it ends what exactly is this tell me the name in the comment section not right now this is another graph or this is another map rather sorry which i would want all of you to look at carefully how israel actually started and how it has ended i am sure all of you would know the story after the second world war there was this feeling in europe that the jewish community needs a country of their own because the jewish community the jewish people were being executed all around the world in europe especially so they wanted a new country for themselves and that is how western powers such as britain mainly and france also came together and said okay we will ensure that you have an area here where palestine lies we will try and settle the jews in the palestinian area in 1917 the green portion that you see is where the palestinians used to live and blue portion is where the jewish population used to live and with passing years as you can see how these areas have changed most of the neighborhood nations be it jordan be it egypt all of them have fought wars against israel but none of them have been successful do and do look into this map as well but the previous map is more important about which are the countries that share the common border another small news story from prelims point of view is about the james webb space telescope the james webb space telescope right now as you know is a most powerful space telescope in the entire world this has given certain photos they have made certain observations about huge galaxies which were formed 500 to 700 million years ago million years after the big bang now the interesting observation that has been done here is galaxies are much more massive than what was expected meaning that the scientists till now believe that galaxies are expanding at let's say x rate but as per the telescope the size of the galaxy seems to be much much bigger than that so the scientists now believe that maybe our expectation of the speed at which the galaxies are expanding was lower maybe the galaxies are actually expanding at a much much faster pace the james webb space telescope is extremely extremely famous it is by far the most powerful space machine that we have it is a result of a joint collaboration between usa european space agency and the canadian space agency please do remember this kind of information as well because what happens is the kind of questions that you will get here is first statement about james webb telescope it is a joint venture between nasa and european space agency only because we usually don't assume that canada also has a space agency and they would also collaborate here so this kind of factual information has to be remembered by you it's a joint collaboration between nasa european space agency and the canadian space agency it is currently at l2 lagrange point i'm sure all of you know the lagrange point please do tell me in the comment section how many lagrange points do we have exactly not right now in the comment section do let me know how many lagrange points do we have and what is the significance of these points why is it that india is even planning its gaganyaan on one of these points only what is the significance of that specifically so lagrange point is where this james webb space telescope is located right now on point number 2 the objective of the james webb space telescope is very simple number 1 it will look into how the stars in the galaxies exist right now it will try to map their past so in simple term the scientists are trying to chart their journey from big bang till today 
because there are still a lot of questions that are unanswered what happened after the big bang how did we reach here how are the galaxies expanding at what rate are they expanding etc this is what the big the james Webb Space telescope has to answer it will also compare different galaxies in today's times it will see where the stars and systems are being born and it will observe the atmosphere of extra solar planets as well which are the building blocks of the universe this is what the james webb space telescope wants to achieve in the long run again another article from science as i told you usually sunday's hindu newspaper is filled with a lot of short news stories about science this news story is about neutrinos so there is an experiment being conducted in japan where the scientists in Japan are trying to understand what are the antiparticles of neutrinos. Now, what is antiparticle? Every elementary particle, every those microscopic particles have an antiparticle. Now, what is those antiparticle? If a particle and its antiparticle combine, if they join with each other, the, the logic is that these will destroy each other. That is what the antiparticle is. For example, electrons antiparticle is positron. So when these two combine each other, combine with each other, they will be destroyed. So basically what happens is for a particle, the antiparticle will be dis will destroy it because it has opposite charge, because it has a similar kind of a mass and they will be destroying each other. The problem with neutrinos is neutrinos, as you know, do not have any charge since they don't have any charge as such that is why it is very difficult for the scientist to identify what are the antiparticles of neutrinos electrons have a negative charge so they know that other particles having positive charge may be the antiparticles to electrons but with neutrinos the problem is since they have no charge it is difficult for the scientist to identify what will be their antiparticle the neutrinos are the second most abundant particle in the cosmos and they are released in millions and billions and billions through the cores of the stars. So billions and billions of neutrinos in fact are passing on through our body even right now and we don't really see them. Now these neutrinos since there is no specific antiparticle that has been identified scientists believe that maybe neutrinos themselves are the antiparticles. That means maybe when one neutrino is collided with the another one, maybe that is what destroys them because no other particle right now has been found to destroy them. That is what the Japanese scientists have identified. They have said that most probably neutrinos, antiparticle are neutrinos themselves and nothing else because it is difficult to identify any other kind of a particle that is able to destroy neutrinos. Now, Entire world has been trying to study in detail about neutrinos. India also is trying to do the same. In fact, that is why India right now ha is in the process of setting up India Neutrino Observatory. This was something that was in the news a few months back as well. The government of India wants to set up this observatory to observe neutrinos in Tamil Nadu. In the Thani district of Tamil Nadu. It was thought that we will set up this observatory here so and it will be an underground observatory so that when the neutrinos reach there, there is no interference from any other kind of radiation so that we can conduct experiments and study on the neutrinos. However, what has happened is that Tamil Nadu state government has objected to this. Tamil Nadu state government said that no, we will not allow this to happen. Why? They are saying it is an ecologically sensitive area. Tamil Nadu government is saying it's an ecologically sensitive area and we will not allow this to happen. So this neutrino observatory has not been built so far. The Indian government wants to build it about 1200 meters deep into a cave in Tamil Nadu, but the government of Tamil Nadu does not really support it. It is being built underground Why? since the neutrinos will be able to pass through anything they will reach the detector underground but on the other hand other cosmic rays will not reach underground so they will not be able to interfere with that. 
there are other neutron observatories around the world as well but others are usually at 35 degree north or south or higher than 35 degree north or south no neutrino observatory is very close to the equator right now no neutrino observatory is very close to the equator so the logic was that maybe the Indian one will be closer to the equator not very close but maybe closer to the equator but again that has not happened because Tamil Nadu government has objected to this project in fact many experts are saying maybe this observatory will never be built because of all these objections as you can see in the photo it was supposed to be underground about 1200 meters but because Tamil Nadu government says it's an ecologically sensitive area we would not go ahead and build this there's a question from Muskan what is the need to study neutrinos so these neutrinos that the scientists want to study most of them are being developed in the stars so it is assumed that by understanding them we will be able to understand about the stars much more about their formation about their life cycle etc so that is the objective that the scientists have right now the next article that we have here is about hummingbirds so basically the author here says there are certain qualities of hummingbirds that you must remember and there are certain Indian birds also which are very very similar to hummingbirds now hummingbirds were first or are natives of the American continent they are mainly found in Mexico in large numbers in USA also they have been given a name their original name was Hudzilin Hudzilin was a name given to them and this name was given by Aztec what are Aztecs? Aztecs are actually the original inhabitants of Mexico So people who used to live in Mexico, they were the ones who gave this name to the hummingbird called the Hustelin. These hummingbirds are extremely small, one of the smallest, one of the lightest birds. A hummingbird's weight is about 2 grams, just 2 grams. Why are they called the hummingbirds? Because they beat their wings so quickly in order to, in order to actually fly. Their speed of their wings can be... 50 times per second because they float their wings at such a high speed it produces a humming sound and that is why they are called the hummingbird the hummingbird sound is not from their mouth the hummingbird sound is because of the flapping of their wings at such a high speed that is why they are called the hummingbirds in India also we have a similar kind of a bird that is not called a hummingbird in India the kind of bird that we have which we consider as very similar to hummingbirds are called the sunbirds sunbirds in India are similar to hummingbirds but there are slight differences the sunbirds are slightly heavier hummingbirds on the other hand are not that heavy since the hummingbirds are so small and they have to fly at such a fast pace they also breathe in a lot more oxygen as compared to the other species they have the highest metabolic rate amongst all the vertebrates in fact and their other interesting quality is that they can even mimic voice like the parrots please do remember this also because again these kind of small factual informations they don't require a lot of deep analysis but these kind of small factual informations can very very easily be asked in the prelims examination the last news story from the prelims point of view today is that India has been ranked at 42nd amongst 55 nations the international IP index that is international intellectual property index rankings have come out last year India was 43rd now India is 42nd this is not a ranking from UN or something of that sort of organization this is a ranking released from the US chambers of commerce because US believes that they are somehow the granddaddy of all the IP rights all across the world so they are the ones who rank different countries how are they protecting intellectual property rights are they able to safeguard pat patents etc copyrights or not as per the report India is improving we have stronger laws about copyrights but still a lot needs to be done there are some problems in India for example in 2021 India dissolved the intellectual property in a pallet board which is wrong the report also says that India's judiciary takes a long long time 
when it comes to hearing cases about intellectual property rights. I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, when Microsoft came out with the new version of Windows, let's say they released Windows 7 or they released Windows 10, something like that. You are not supposed to get pirated copies of Windows from the market. You are supposed to buy it from Microsoft for 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, whatever the rate is. But in India, in bigger cities where you have those markets, like in Delhi, you have a market called Nehru Place. In Lucknow, you have a market called NASA. So basically what happens is in every big market, in every big city, you have a market where you go to repair your laptops, mobile phones, etc. You go to those places and you will get a pirated version of Windows for 100 rupees, 200 rupees, 300 rupees. Many people go and buy that rather than actually going ahead and paying to Microsoft. This is happening because intellectual property is not being safeguarded in India. That is a problem that US and companies such as Microsoft have that they, their property rights, whatever money that they have spent on research, it all goes to waste because the Indian government doesn't punish people who copy these kind of things. So now Indian government is trying to improve those laws. The US government report also says the same. This international IP index is, as I told you, is compiled by the US Chamber of Commerce. They evaluate different countries on 50 broad parameters. Mostly these include patents, how are they protected or not, copyrights, trademarks, design rights, are they protected or not, system efficacy, are, they, are the governments able to enforce these international laws or not, are trade secrets protected or not, all these things are considered while giving a rating in the IP index by the US Chamber of Commerce. This brings me to the end of the Hindu news analysis for today. As I told you earlier, our single minded endeavor is that after you attend this session, we don't want you to even pick up the Hindu newspaper. That is why we are discussing every single thing from mains and from the prelims point of view as well. There are a couple of mains practice questions here that you can go ahead and practice. Expansion of UPI beyond the Indian borders is another indication of India's rising sort of power comment. Second, rising global debt since the pandemic has only enhanced the north-south divide. In this context, discuss ways to overcome this issue. Both these questions have to be asked within 250 words each. Again, reminding you, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do that right away. And as soon as the session ends, you have to go over to our Telegram channel, attend the quiz based on these articles itself. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you soon. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.